And I would love to welcome you all here today to our webinar on mental health and interpersonal violence and how these things connect and especially connect for our Carolina community. Uh, just quickly, I'm Christy Hurt and I am currently serving as the Chancellor's Chief of Staff and also in the role of the Senior Prevention Strategy Officer in Student Affairs, tying together a lot of the work that we're doing in the violence prevention world and our response world. We can talk a little bit about that today as well, but I'm really grateful to have you all here today with us. Uh, we have faculty, students, and staff, of course, joining us to have this dialogue today. And also, I'm so grateful to have our uh, wonderful presenters uh, today with us. And we'll go into a sort of a panel discussion, if you will, uh, in a few minutes after giving some background. Uh, just as a matter of course, I want to share with you a little bit about our mental health seminar series, which is essentially a follow-up from our mental health summit that we held in November of 2021, where we heard broad strokes about mental health in the Carolina community and decided that as follow-up from that original summit, we wanted to host seminars to provide an opportunity to have more in-depth conversations and converse, conversations about specific topics um, that mental health intersects with. And our first seminar uh, of the semester was on the intersection of mental health, faith, and spirituality, which is a really interesting uh, topic to talk about. And the second, we discussed the intersection of mental health and substance use, uh, also a really powerful conversation. And today we're creating space for us to talk about the intersection of mental health and interpersonal violence. And again, it's a difficult topic and it's a sensitive topic. And I wanna make sure we all spend some time today taking care of ourselves and doing what we need to do to engage um, safely and in a way that helps us uh, grow and learn. So we'll talk about that as well. That is um, essentially just a quick overview of what we're doing. I wanna provide a moment for our panelists to introduce themselves just briefly with their names and titles and then we will um, get into some background and I'll have a chance for the panelists to talk about themselves in a little bit more depth in just a few moments. But Avery, I'm wondering if you'll start. Sure, I'm Avery Cook. I am a clinical social worker by training and currently serving as the interim director of counseling and psychological services. Thank you very much, Holly. Hi everyone, my name is Holly Lovern. I use she, her pronouns and I'm one of the gender balance services coordinators here on campus. Fantastic, and Shelly. Hi hey everyone, my name is Shelly Gist Kennedy. I am one of the violence prevention coordinators here at UNC. Excellent. And this is also all a big plan for me to hang out with some of my favorite people on campus and have a really interesting conversation. So thank you all for being our wonderful panelists. It's great to be working with you on this. And I want to let the audience know that we are going to be able to try to engage with you over both the chat and Q&A uh, sort of features, if you will, today. Uh, type your questions in as you have them and we'll answer them as we can. I am grateful that both Caroline and Sarah are here helping us moderate those. And we will, of course, have a Q&A session at the end. And for that portion um, of that dialogue, we will also, of course, stop the recording to make sure that we're affording present or attendees a chance to participate uh, without feeling like they are being recorded. OK, so rule number one. Uh, as I already mentioned, this is a difficult topic. We all come to this work and come to this space with different lived experiences and sort of um, perceptions and perspectives on interpersonal violence. So I encourage you all to do what you can to take care of yourselves during this session, which may include stepping away, taking a break, um, taking a walk. We just heard about taking you know, a walk while you're listening to your webinars. That can be a great way to engage while you're out in the environment around you. So do what you need to do to take care of yourselves today. I also want to flip to a couple of, if you will, sort of guidelines, ground rules, and we use these for most of the sessions that we do on this topic. We know that the range of experiences in our Zoom room is profound, and so everybody's coming at this from sort of different frames, and we want to create room for people to be learning in this space, to uh, feel their own experiences in this space as they do, and we ask that you just respect that and respect people's privacy. If folks do share things in the chat or if they... Um, uh, offer personal experiences, please keep those in this space together. And if you're asking questions, ask from a genuine place of learning and seeking to understand. Um, these sessions I think are also very important because we are figuring out complex topics and ways these things affect our Carolina community together. And we wanna create the biggest container to hold all of those vast experiences while we have this dialogue. So that's essentially the top of the hour stuff. Our plan today is to talk just real quickly about resources. And I think it's important to start with resources in the spirit of taking care of ourselves. Where can we seek assistance? Where can we send our friends who might need assistance? Uh, what are the things that can help gird us as we move through these difficult topics and difficult spaces? We're gonna do a little bit of level setting with just interpersonal violence 101. And then we're gonna talk about mental health and interpersonal violence. And then we're gonna get to the meat of the matter with our panel discussion. 
Uh, at the close, we will talk about ways we can support victims and survivors in these spaces and of course get to Q&A. So that is our game plan. Hope that works. Um, I promised we'd talk about resources first. And whenever we talk about resources at the university, we wanna talk about things that are confidential resources and also things that are private resources. And this is an important split because it really um, provides folks with an understanding of what will happen once they tell their stories to people. And we found that it's really important, of course, for people to know if folks are disclosing sensitive information, what will happen with that information once it's passed along. And so we break these categories down into confidential and private, because if something is confidential, the information will not be shared beyond the initial disclosure unless uh, it, it meets one of the sort of standards of law, threat to harm of self or others where things would need to be passed along. So generally people can be sure that information shared with one of these confidential resources won't move beyond that room uh, unless required by law, which is that narrow set of circumstances. Things that are private will only be shared with people who have a very specific need to have that information. So we never put email information or any of this information on blast, if you will, that is held very tightly um, with specific purposes. And so if folks wanna seek assistance, that, that's one of the decision points that they will want to um, have an understanding of. Is it something that they wanna share confidentially or do they wanna seek assistance in a way that would hold someone accountable, pursue an investigation? And in that case, information would need to be um, shared among a small group. So what those resources are, um, the support resources that are confidential are our gender violence services coordinators, and Holly is one of those, and she can share a little bit about that resource. Our gender violence services coordinators are right now housed in the Carolina Women's Center. Uh, we'll be moving over into student affairs in these next few weeks uh, as a unit there with our violence prevention folks, but are essentially our campus-based advocates. So a great first place to send someone who wants to know what their options might be, wants a safe place to talk, uh, wants to think through what their next options are to help their friends, whatever that might be. They are not counselors um, by licensure or anything like that, but our advocates support people and provide that caring and sensitive ear and space uh, for folks to think through their options, get support, do professor notifications uh, and get immediate kinds of assistance. That's a great option for folks. Similarly, and Avery is here to talk about this, we have counseling and psychological services. And as you probably know, that therapist client relationship is also confidential. Folks can walk into CAPS and get a triage appointment and be seen and have their needs met in that space from a therapeutic place. Another really great confidential option. And then one that folks don't know as much about uh, might be our university ombuds office. And our ombuds office is a space that supports faculty, students, and staff on a range of issues and is confidential. And I emphasize the word range because where sort of counseling and psychological services also provide support on a range of issues, but um, sort of emotional support, if you will, people who are in crisis. The ombuds office is a place folks can go to talk about things that are troubling in their office, a workplace conflict, uh, but can also talk about other experiences of harm that they have um, had and try to seek some support or help. So it's not necessarily just a crisis sort of focus or a therapeutic focus, but it's a place to get another set of eyes and ears on the situation and find some comfort support in a confidential space. So we have those options. And then we have the reporting and private options. And typically folks engage these spaces when they want something else to happen based on the sharing of their information. So you might file a report, for example, with the Equal Opportunity and Compliance Office if you wanna hold someone accountable for the harm they perpetrated against someone else. You would also work with the Equal Opportunity and Compliance Office if you want to have uh, a professor notified and exam changed and other accommodations provided that might go beyond what the Gender Violence Services Coordinators or CAPS could help with. So it's a place to seek assistance, support, investigations, remedies, um, and that's a great space. And then lastly, of course, police. UNC Police is a great place to send people who want to report, uh, who want to pursue criminal charges. So. Those are some of our options there. Those can all be found in greater detail on our safe.unc.edu website, which I will put up at the end of our presentation. But we do start there. Okay, interpersonal harassment and violence. What are we talking about? This is a wide scope of experiences uh, that we think about under the umbrella of interpersonal violence and harassment. We're talking about dating violence, domestic violence, sexual or gender-based harassment, sexual assault or sexual violence, and sexual exploitation, interpersonal violence, stalking, and even childhood abuse or sexual abuse. And this might not be a complete list of all the things folks might consider when we talk about interpersonal violence, but this is a lot of what we contain in the university space, specifically around our Title IX or Equal Opportunity and Compliance policies. Take the first multiple bullets down to right before we get to child sexual abuse or um, childhood abuse. Um, 
we are often talking about gender-based violence when we use the term interpersonal violence, and we are looking at um, uh, sexual harm or interpersonal sort of dating violence and, and, and physical violence in that space. And so we're talking about a very big umbrella of experiences that people have had before they get to campus or while they're on campus or may even have after campus and the impacts of, um, on their mental health of having had these in their history or in their current environment. So I just wanna focus on that real quickly. All of these really are based on the concept that there is some kind of sexual activity, contact or other form of um, abuse that happens without consent. And so I, so I always find it's important to ground our thinking in what is consent, because if we're thinking about behaviors or actions that happen without our consent, it's important to have a shared understanding of what consent is before we go into that conversation. And so by our policy, our consent definition is the communication of uh, an affirmative, conscious, or freely made decision by each participant to engage in agreed upon sexual activity. That must include an outward demonstration through mutually understandable words and actions that indicate a clear willingness to engage in that sexual contact. And consent, of course, can be withdrawn at any time. So when you think about uh, sexual violence, sexual harassment, we're talking about forms of contact or conduct or communication that happen without someone's agreement, uh, according to these terms. There are some easy ways to remember that. We think about ACE for consent. You're thinking about a 100% agreement, freely made and conscious communicated clearly every time. And so one of the monikers we use for our students is think about ACE. Um, but it's important to note these things here that consent can't be, they can't be inferred from silence or passivity, can't be obtained by force or coercion or incapacitation. It can't be assumed based on consent to another or previous sexual activity. And it can't be assumed uh, based on some kind of current or former dating or sexual relationship. So if you center consent as the um, fulcrum, if you will, of the other kinds of behaviors, we're looking at sexual activity with consent as healthy, as um, freely chosen, as all the things that we want it to be in our environment. But if we're looking at activity that happens without consent, we're talking about these forms of interpersonal violence um, that lead to the mental health con uh, sort of outcomes and consequences that we're going to discuss in a little bit more detail. Just a sense of the scope of the problem. Uh, one in five women uh, in the U.S. have experienced some kind of completed or um, attempted sexual assault in their lifetimes, and nearly a quarter of men have experienced some kind of forced sexual contact uh, in the course of their lifetimes. So this is something that if you really think about the UNC community and you're thinking about one in five or one in four uh, experiencing some form of sexual harm in the course of their lifetimes, that our problem is vast. And uh, as you can imagine, we're not even confident that all of our reporting numbers are complete because it's really hard to get a fix on who exactly has had these experiences in their lives. Survey data is difficult. People don't often want to engage. Uh, we can't rely on criminal justice numbers because people don't always report when they experience harm. But we're very confident in saying that the problem is vast, widespread, um, harms people based on, on all genders. And while this is a topic for another day, doesn't um, it certainly affects some people more than others. And we'll see how that happens on our UNC community with the statistic I have uh, coming up. So. This is a big problem for our nation. It's a big problem for our campus. It's a big problem everywhere. 81% uh, of women and 43% of men have described that they've experienced some form of sexual harassment in their lifetimes. So again, we're not always talking about sexual contact, physical contact, but we're also talking about harassment, behaviors that um, create problems in the workplace, create problems in um, other situations. And so I think it's important to note how vast the problem of sexual harassment is that 81% and 43% of our folks have experienced it. Uh, in their worlds. So very, very vast again. And then the other statistic I have up here is one in three women of the, of the women who've experienced sexual violence in their lifetimes, one in three had their first sexual assault experience before they were the age of 17. And so I wanna call that number out because that shows so much to me of what people are coming into campus with already in their backpacks, if you will, of lived experiences that set them up for uh, future challenges. The later life consequences of sexual violence, especially as a child can be vast. And if folks are already coming to us with these lived experiences of violence and abuse in their homes, uh, I think it tells us that we have a lot of work to do to make sure folks are supported in our community in a way that really helps them thrive. And so that's uh, a statistic I always really hang on to and, and it matters a lot in some of the thinking that I have done over the years on the topic. Um, lest you think we only have nation national data, we also have UNC specific data. Um, and what we see here is that we have since entering college, undergraduate women and, and trans um, gender nonconforming and queer folks have higher rates um, of violence. And so this statistic that I pulled out here is about specifically non-consensual penetration. And I don't think I have a pointer, but maybe you can see this. 
we have nearly 20% of undergraduate women respondents have reported having non-consensual penetration um, while they're here um, during the time that they're in college. So I wanna point that out, that is happening on our campus. We know it's happening and we have data to support uh, how much of a problem that it is. Of those folks, 27% of undergraduate women respondents said this was happening um, by their, in their fourth year or higher. And then I wanna point out here that we have slightly higher rates among our transgender nonconforming and queer folks. Um, and so we have 20, 21, nearly 21% here. And then of course, we know that we have vast problems in our graduate and professional student populations too. So the whole AAU data report with our um, statistics that look like this is also on our SAFE website. So you can pull those in more detail. It's a large report. There are some slides that you can pull up that might be useful, but I wanted to bring out that we do have the UNC data and it's stark. Uh, another stark piece of data is that we have on this one, if you're incorporating also um, non-consensual penetration with touching uh, since entering college, that number goes up, of course, because we're capturing a broader sphere of conduct. So we have 35% of our undergraduate women respondents um, explain that they have had a non-consensual penetrative um, sort of experience or touching since they got to college. So again, looking at this wide range of behavior, vast portion of our population having experienced it, this is clearly something we need to be looking at. All right. So what does this mean? I want to bring this back to the uh, childhood piece that I flagged a moment ago. Um, there was a study out of, I believe it started in California with Kaiser Permanente, looking at what were the causes of adult obesity. I could talk about this for a while too, but I will spare you some of the details. But the adverse childhood experiences study uh, matters a lot in this space, again, thinking about who our population of students is. And what this study found was that when they're looking at outcomes like obesity, and then a whole host of other um, lifetime health and mental health outcomes, what a lot of the root causes were for these adulthood challenges were adverse childhood experiences, of which interpersonal violence is one. Um, the a parent being in prison, a divorce, other, other forms of abuse, witnessing abuse, witnessing violence, these are all forms of adverse childhood experiences. But for the purposes of this conversation, I wanna think about being in a household with domestic violence, being an abused child. These are things that our students are already coming to us with that create, if you will, some of these um, health risk behaviors or social impairments or other kinds of social problems, excuse me, that uh, turn up in our mental health spaces. And so as we dig into this conversation, I think we need to be thinking about these lifetimes of experiences that people come to us with. Students, faculty, and staff all have childhoods and they come to us potentially with these adverse childhood experiences. So they come to our door on day one, having had potentially some challenges that lead to some later life outcomes like mental health pieces that we wanna talk about. And we also of course have populations that are experiencing harm while they're here. And we wanna talk about what those impacts are. And so I wanna tee up the conversation thinking about the wide range of ways people come into the space looking for some support around their mental health struggles, challenges, needs after experiencing any of these forms of interpersonal violence. So I just did a whole bunch of um, explaining really quickly, but those are the pieces that I wanna walk into this next panel discussion with. We have a population that's had a lot of, a lot of struggles both on campus and off campus, just like you see across the country in all sorts of places. This isn't unusual at UNC, but I think we have a deeply committed campus here to help support people. And that's what I wanna dig into today. So without further ado, I think I, um, oh, wait, I have this one more slide, oh, my apologies. Uh, of course, I'm gonna turn this over to our panel in just a second, but we do know that of our short and long-term consequences, the things that our populations might experience are post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, eating disorders, and substance use disorders. So there isn't a breakdown necessarily of 5% of survivors will experience X, Y, Z thing. We don't have the research to show us that, but we know that a wide range of survivors will experience any of these potential outcomes. And that's what we're going to be moving towards. My apologies. So now I'd like to turn it over to our panel uh, to each spend a few minutes talking about themselves, their roles, and how they see these issues turn up in their worlds. And then I have a series of questions I'll be asking them to unpack this conversation further. And we will of course be um, watching the chat and talking in our Q and A and eager to hear from all of you. So Avery, I'm wondering if you would mind kicking us off, telling us about yourself and your role. Sure. Um, so I, again, I'm the interim director of counseling and psychological services. Um, I have been here for a number of years. Um, I am also a clinician. Um, so at CAPS, we, um, we interact with these issues in a number of ways. Um, when students come in to us, one of the things that we ask about is um, their history with interpersonal violence and different forms of trauma. So we see students that are both reporting 
these these childhood histories um, and childhood experiences with some of this and folks that are coming in having had um, experiences with interpersonal violence during their time at UNC as we've just sort of talked about. Um, our role at CAPS is um, to be that confidential space and to provide both treatment and support for, um, for the student and for um, the mental health issues that can arise um, as a result of or in conjunction with these experiences. So we both see folks that are coming in sort of having um, immediately ex experienced um, an experience of uh, violence and trauma, um, in which case our support looks more immediate. It looks like um, both helping them connect with additional resources and helping them process the immediate feelings um, and uh, emotions that come up as a result of this. Um, and that often is done by, by our therapists here um, to help someone sort of feel supported uh, in the immediate immediacy of it. Um, it also looks like folks who are coming in um, who want to explore um, some of those childhood experiences, um, who want to dive into things that they have experienced earlier in their life, um, things that may still be resonating with them now or resonating with them in different ways now. And we find ways um, to not just support them, but oftentimes to help them connect with more open-ended therapy resources so that they have the time and space that they need um, and want to really explore um, these concerns in, in, a, in a more um, uh, slow and gentle way. Um, but our, our goal here at CAPS is, is both to make sure that students um, are getting connected to the support that is most helpful for them in that moment with how they're presenting, and to make sure that we're also um, connecting them to any other resources on campus that would be helpful and any other supports that they need. Um, and, and we know that, that experiences with this um, form of interpersonal violence and trauma um, can sort of have a ripple effect. There can be things that come up at different times in someone's life, depending on other things that are going on. And so it may not be a linear experience that they're having. And so we want students to uh, feel like they can come in and access us at whatever point in their process they are um, and know that they can get the support that they need um, from our folks here. So that's that's probably my, my biggest introduction. I could kind of go on forever, but I will turn it over to some other folks. Thank you, Avery. Shelly, can you go next? Sure thing. Um, so as I mentioned before, my role here is violence prevention coordinator. Um, there are two of us on campus. We work to sort of coordinate all of the violence prevention efforts that are occurring across campus um, and seek to, to really oversee and implement um, the messaging on campus, the education and training um, around all issues related to violence prevention. Um, and so that looks like offering trainings, facilitated workshops, um, having um, conversations with staff and faculty on campus about how they can integrate violence prevention content into um, their course offerings or into their work that they're doing with students on campus um, and kind of serve as a hub for all things violence prevention. Um, and so we're, we're talking about affirmative consent. We're talking about bystander intervention, um, healthy relationships. How do you communicate your boundaries um, and trying to encourage students to, to think critically about how they interact with one another, um, what they want campus culture to look like and how we can, can really create a, a community space on campus where um, violence isn't tolerated. Um, and so that's a lot of the work that we're doing in thinking about how it connects to this issue, you know, if we know that that mental health uh, and interpersonal violence are really connected with one another and they have sort of this bi-directional relationship where uh, interpersonal violence has negative outcomes on one's mental health and people's mental health um, is also, uh, can be a risk or protective factor against perpetrating or experiencing uh, interpersonal violence. And so um, in recognizing that these two things are intertwined, 
it informs the work that we're doing in the prevention space and it informs the conversation that we're having about mental health on campus. Um, and I'm sure we're gonna dive more into the specifics of what that looks like um, as we get into the, the discussion, kind of the meat of the discussion here. Um, but because of that, mental health is, is certainly a component of the work that we're doing in the violence prevention space on campus. Thank you, Shelley and Holly. So similar to Shelley, there are two uh, violence or uh, gender violence services coordinators. So it's myself and Kayla Zollinger. Um, and so like Christy had mentioned earlier, we provide confidential support for all students, faculty and staff here at the University of all gender identities. Um, and within our role, what I really appreciate is that folks can access us and utilize the services kind of as they see fit for them. So we have folks that we maybe connect with once for 15 minutes. We talk about some questions they have. We get them connected to some different resources, and then we never hear from them again. And that's totally OK. Um, there are other folks that we've worked with throughout their time at Carolina. And so it really we have tried to build the program and kind of the services so that folks can use it in a way that feels comfortable for them um, and that feels like they have some ongoing support here, which I think is really important when we are talking about how the impact can be ongoing for folks um, from trauma related to interpersonal violence, but it can also change and evolve for folks. And we see that a lot in our space where folks maybe um, talk about how what they needed and the impact that they felt the first couple of weeks after an experience feels very different than what they're needing years later. And being able to really validate for folks that that makes sense, that's really common. And that's why these resources are here at the university and in the community. Um, from our kind of experience, I've been here going into six years in the fall. And this past um, fall semester was the most number of um, individuals we've served in the time that the GBSC role has been here since 2014. So what we know is that the um, demand for services and folks seeking out support is increasing in our space. Um, and we see that as a good thing because we know that violence exists on our campus. We know folks are being impacted. And so for us seeing that more folks are reaching out hopefully means that more people are aware of the support that's available, not only in our space, but across the university. And that folks are feeling that they, they can take that step in reaching out and accessing services and support that they need. Um, so with mental health, I think what I really kind of appreciate of what I've been able to kind of learn from the folks I've been connected with and what they've shared with us over time is this really impacts folks so differently and so uniquely. And so it's really thinking through like what are people's needs specific to them and how do we then tailor kind of the support that exists, the different um, resources and kind of thinking through how can we puzzle this together for folks at um, UNC. And so uh, looking forward to getting into the conversation further in a few minutes. Okay, I wanted to take off the slides so we could see the faces while we get into our conversation a little bit more. And so you all have done a great job explaining what the services are and sort of what you see in your spaces. I wonder if we can dig into that conversation a little bit more deeply. And so I want to ask the question, like, what do we actually know about the intersection of interpersonal violence and mental health? You know, I talked about the sort of data and what it tells us about the sort of incidence and prevalence and what outcomes might be. But can you talk to us about what data we actually have around um, how this impacts our community? And that could be anecdotal data or otherwise. And Avery, I'm wondering if you can sort of tell us what is known in this space. Sure. So certainly it's something we see in our data. We, we when we look at the data of folks that have come in for an initial appointment, again, one of the things that we ask uh, is for folks if, if they're comfortable to self-disclose any experiences of interpersonal violence or trauma that they've experienced. Um, and so we can see those numbers. It, it may or may not be what the person is identifying as their presenting concern. Um, and sometimes it it actually has nothing to do with why they're coming in. Other times we see that there really is a connection, that, um, that the student is identifying some anxiety that they're experiencing maybe for the first time. And when talking a little bit more about some past experiences that they've had, we can see that there's a connection. Um, the same thing with any experiences with depression and some things like that, that we can see a link between that previous experience and, and what it is that they're feeling now. Um, other times it is, they're sort of presenting concern that they're coming into us and they're coming to us in the immediate aftermath of a traumatic experience or an experience with interpersonal violence. Um, and the, the things that 
they're presenting with then are, are really related to that trauma. Difficulty with concentration, difficulty with sleep, um, uh, feeling um, hypervigilant, um, all of these sort of things. And we also see the ways that it then impacts them in other ways on the campus. So it's not just sort of isolated to their own personal experience with their mental health, but it's impacting how they're interacting with peers, um, how comfortable they're feeling in different spaces. Um, it's impacting them academically um, with their ability to sort of um, focus on their academic work or really sort of give it their all. So there are all these sort of ripple effects. Um, and the, the more support we can give a student in those moments, um, the, the more helpful it is. But as Holly said, it really is so individual for each student. Um, and it really is a matter of not just looking at, at what you're seeing or even at what's being reported, but really talking with the person about the totality of how that experience is for them and what they're feeling they're needing in any given moment. I really appreciate that. That sense of tailoring to individual needs is just so important in this space. And the notion that you brought up that folks don't come in necessarily saying, I experienced this form of harm, ergo, I need this set of services. So it requires a lot of dexterity to sort of feel through what somebody might actually be looking for, what they need at that moment in time, and how that changes throughout their experience here. So that's really helpful. Holly, I'm wondering how this turns up in your space. Is it different, the same? I mean, what are you seeing? Yeah, I think a lot of it's similar. I think, you know, for us, we've been talking about folks are coming in kind of at different points. And so we'll have um, folks that reach out to us and they're really comfortable disclosing their experiences. They're comfortable talking about the impact. They have an awareness. They know what their needs are um, and they know what they're looking for. We also have people that come in and they're like, I don't even know if this is the right space, but I saw you on the website, figured I'd reach out. And so we're really doing a lot of that initial exploration um, and sometimes there's not really necessarily like a right answer too. And so I think it's helping folks kind of have a space where they can process their experiences for what it means for them and kind of what their needs are versus feeling like they have to have a certain label for their experiences or be defining them by some of the language we were talking about earlier. Um, and, and we share with folks, you know, there are times and spaces where that kind of definition or, you know, actually defining that experience with that language is going to be important when we're thinking about policies, when we're thinking about procedures, things like that. Um, but in our space, that doesn't really matter. We can do our wide range of support without having to kind of talk through all of that. Um, I think a lot of times what we hear too, being on a campus and why I think having the resources available on campus is so important is because for a lot of folks, this may be the first time they've been able to access support whether it's financial needs, whether it's location, whether it's there in a safer space to do it. Um, we hear from a lot of folks that whether it's something that happened, you know, a couple of days ago or years ago, they're in a place where they feel like they can access that support. And so I think that's um, really important in thinking through kind of how do we make sure the university community is equipped to help folks and support folks in navigating that. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of times with uh, just different, Kind of affiliations of campus right students are going to have complex needs but they're going to be differing from faculty and staff needs and like graduate students who are kind of playing multiple roles on campus student and employee um, we'll hear from some folks where the campus feels really helpful to access the support and that's what they're looking for um, we'll hear from some folks who are like you know what i want this kind of separated from my carolina experience like how do i get connected to the community so i can kind of have some delineation in how i'm accessing and so I think it's, you know, we we hear from folks who have just so many different needs and kind of thinking through what does that look like. Um, but ultimately, I think it's really one of the things we're kind of seeing, I would say even more recently, is just the complexity and the multi-layered nature of experiences. Um, folks that are really trying to hold together a lot of realities for themselves of, you know, I need this, but I'm really concerned about accessing this resource. or I really want to report. Here are my concerns about that. Um, and so thinking through kind of how do we help folks have a place to really hold those all together and think through and have some support um, and trying to figure out what does that look like for them um, and being able to really prioritize themselves in what they're doing, their next steps, what their needs are. Um, so mm -hmm. That's really helpful. And I'm wondering, Holly, I'm coming back to you with a follow up. Um, when folks access CAPS, right, there's a presumption that somebody's seeking services for their mental health, right? Like that's what you walk in the door for often. Um, with gender violence services, that's not always the case. Somebody may come in 
seeking adjustments to their schedule, a professor notification, a clarification about options, whatever it might be. I'm wondering if you can help us tease apart, you know, not every survivor of IPV will report or need mental health support, right? That's not always, it's not a one for one. And so I'm wondering if you can talk to us about that. Yeah, sometimes, you know, we'll have folks who come in and they are very specific and, you know, this, I'm looking for help and communicating to my professor, or I feel like I need some kind of accommodations in the workspace. How do I go about navigating that? Um, we do, you know, work with folks all the time who are really interested in therapy and haven't really ever even thought about what it means to connect with a therapist. We have folks who have worked with a therapist for years and feel very um, confident and supported in their therapeutic relationship. And so they're kind of looking through what are kind of the other types of assistance and kind of support measures that are outside of that clinical space that can kind of help with, I always call it more the logistical parts of your campus experience, um, where you're working, how you're going to class, where you're living, things like that. Um, and so that's something we really try to communicate to folks when they are thinking about connecting with us is we don't need to know a whole lot of information to be able to put those things in place. And so there's never going to be an expectation that someone needs to come in and kind of redisclose their experiences or the impact um, to be able to seek out professor notifications or to be able to get um, kind of connected to the Equal Opportunity Compliance Office. Like folks can really focus on their needs and then we can kind of go from there and what they need. Um, but yeah, we see a wide range where folks, um, you know, may have really strong awareness of how this is intersecting with their mental health. Um, and we have folks that are very, you know, aware and confident. Yep, I know what I'm doing. I've, I've equipped myself with a different support and here's kind of what I need from you specifically. Yep, exactly. I wanted to emphasize that even though I threw up the slide early about kinds of mental health impacts, not every survivor has those, right? So that that's, it's, it's different for every person and we make no assumptions about what folks need, which is why I love hearing this narrative around these tailored services. So thanks for elevating that. Shelly, how does this turn up in your space? You're coming at this from a different vantage point. You're trying to prevent it. So how does mental health matter? Yeah, I think I would say that it gives more weight to the work that we're doing, right? Because you're not only potentially preventing a single instance of violence, right? You're preventing all of the impacts that come with that. Um, and so when you think about, you know, the long-term effects of experiencing interpersonal violence or of witnessing interpersonal violence, um, it, uh, it makes this work all that more important because you're preventing this whole host of ongoing negative outcomes for folks who are experiencing violence. Um, and it also gives you a longer term perspective to the work. So as we're talking with students about um, conflict management and uh, establishing healthy boundaries, we know that later in life of you know, having a, a family where caregivers work through conflicts in a peaceful manner, is a protective violent, a protective factor against further experiences of violence. So this is affecting the ways that families will interact in the future. This is affecting um, really kind of the long-term uh, future of the people who are leaving our campus and are, are going to go out and interact with so many people beyond the walls of this space. Um, and so while the, the focus is to create a safe community here on campus and to create a campus where violence isn't occurring, it also is going to have this ripple effect in the world at large as the people who are UNC students now are going out and forming relationships and forming families and existing in workplaces and creating nonviolent cultures in other spaces. Um, and so sometimes we have to kind of zoom out and think what is the effect of this work, not just on our campus, but for these people as individuals who are going to lead rich lives, interacting with so many other people, and how do we want to help inform them of how they can interact with people in a healthy way, um, how they can make sure that they have healthy boundaries, that they feel confident in communicating their own needs, um, that they're able to show empathy uh, towards others and, and understand the ways in which uh, their actions affect other people. Um, and I think it also is helpful in, in the prevention sphere to talk about, you know, when you're not harming someone, it's not just about not enacting harm in this instant, right? So if we're trying to talk to potential perpetrators about not enacting violence against someone, it's not just about that moment. It's about these other impacts that that person could then carry with them. Um, and you know, as we look at, at the connection to 
PTSD or depression or substance use and these things that have long-term effects on survivors, um, I think that that also gives weight to the work that we're doing with folks to try to prevent perpetration to say, look, it's not just about this one instance of harm. Um, and so I think that these are, are some of the connections that we're making uh, in our prevention work on campus. That's incredible. And I, I really like the big view of prevention as something that ripples beyond campus and how you're preventing all these other consequences um, when we're talking about the whole sort of continuum, if you will, of harm. And that's really powerful. And if folks on this uh, webinar want to work to prevent violence, I recommend highly that you contact Shelly immediately to get on board with this because it's important work. It's deep work uh, and, and super meaningful for our campus community and beyond. Thank you. I'm wondering if we can shift for just a second to talking about secondary trauma because uh, that has its own host of mental health impacts. And for the sake of the Zoom room, I'm wondering if Holly or Avery, if you would take a, a moment to help us understand the concept of secondary trauma, what is it? Yeah, so secondary trauma um, is gonna be when folks who are maybe supporting individuals who have directly firsthand experienced trauma, um, either maybe they've witnessed trauma or they've heard disclosures or they're kind of in the act of supporting folks when they have that kind of secondary impact from that trauma. So it's not the same that it directly happened to them, but it can have that ripple impact. Um, and I would say this is something that we see a lot on our campus community. Um, we see this from kind of friends who are supporting um, each other. We see this from peers and colleagues. We hear this a lot from faculty who are receiving disclosures from students. Um, and we see this a lot just kind of even as we're talking about these issues on campus. Um, I think that's something that's really important to remember is that, you know, given how large our campus is, there are folks that are interacting with this issue and hearing about it really kind of for the first time in meaningful ways. And we have folks who are very familiar with these issues and think engaging in the work in a lot of different capacities. And so thinking about kind of that secondary trauma and that response, a lot of times we'll hear from folks who maybe say, you know, it, it feels kind of weird, like I, this didn't happen to me, but I'm having a really kind of similar but distinct response. Like I'm also struggling to sleep or I'm struggling to concentrate or I feel really burned out. And a lot of times we hear from folks like they're really wanting to support the people in their lives or they're really wanting to help individuals who have been directly impacted, but it's trying to find that balance of self-care of how can I best show up for those folks um, while also recognizing this could have a really tangible impact on me. Um, and that's something from our space where um, we work with both folks who've been directly impacted, but also indirectly impacted. And so I think that's a really important thing for folks to note is that resources can um, provide support for folks kind of in any of those different capacities. But I think it's something that we are, as a society, becoming more aware of, but not probably as aware of as we should be. And so a lot of times we're really working, I think, to validate for folks like, yeah, it makes sense you would have an impact. Um, and sometimes I think people have kind of a guilt associated with that, that they have to kind of process through that it, it is okay that it's impacting it. It makes sense you're human too, but like, here's how we can kind of balance you um, having your own response while also being able to kind of hold the space for the individual directly impacted as well. Avery, I don't know if there's anything you'd add to that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you, you said it beautifully. Um, I think we do see students coming in um, impacted by secondary trauma, and there is that sort of hesitancy around getting support for that, right? almost sort of questioning, do is this is this valid? Um, and so we do absolutely want to validate those experiences, and that the impact of secondary trauma is very real and absolutely. Um, something to get support around. And that can not only look um, like support around the sort of um, feelings and emotions that are coming up as a result of that, but also talking with someone about ways that they can take care of themselves and set boundaries in a way that feels safe for them. So that they're both continuing to support this person that they, that they care about or that they're connected to, while also not sort of draining their own batteries to the point that they are also being pretty significantly impacted in ways that, um, that are impacting their functioning um, or impacting their sort of way that they're moving through the world. Um, and so we absolutely want to encourage folks not just to get support if they are directly impacted by an experience of interpersonal violence or trauma, but also if, if they're feeling this impact in a secondary way. I'm wondering if you, oh, go ahead, Shelly. Yeah, I was just going to jump in and say this is something that we see in the prevention space as well. So, you know, some of it is informing our, our programming in what Avery was talking about and thinking about how to set healthy boundaries and take 
care of yourself when you're providing support to someone who's had this experience. This is something we discuss in our Haven trainings and how someone who's receiving disclosures can really think realistically about what they're able to offer in terms of support while still taking care of themselves and their own needs. Um, and then also with, you know, with our students who are, are serving as peer educators or are sitting um, on our advisory group or being our fellows, they're just inundated with conversations around violence. Um, and that can be really exhausting and, and, and take a toll um, you know, both in, in terms of secondary trauma, where maybe you're hearing about specific instances of violence, but also in this, this notion of like tertiary trauma, where you're just kind of inundated with the issue constantly, and you're thinking about and talking about violence, um, and everything you do is kind of uh, tinted with this awareness of this massive social issue. Um, and so that can lead to, to people feeling really hopeless or anxious or hypervigilant um, and can have real tangible mental health outcomes and people don't recognize necessarily what the root of that is because they didn't have one single experience of violence that's causing this. It's more of the mental toll of engaging with this issue day in, day out. Um, and that's something that is especially difficult for survivors who are doing this work. Um, where we see some, some mental health outcomes and, and we have to really encourage people to think through um, how can they set, set boundaries with this work and what can they be doing to um, seek support for their own mental health needs in this space. So add some descriptions to this for me. What does secondary trauma look like for somebody who might not have heard of it before? What does it feel like? What do people describe if they're experiencing it? How would somebody know that they're experiencing secondary trauma? Yeah, so it, they might, uh, some common symptoms are like general hopelessness or pessimism, um, chronic exhaustion is really big, um, feeling constantly guilty or like you're not doing enough, uh, either for the person who you're helping or to tackle this issue. Um, there might be lingering feelings of sadness or of anger um, about this other person's situation. Um, someone might have a difficult time managing their boundaries um, especially if they're trying to provide care for someone who's experienced violence. Um, and then on the flip side of kind of that over empathizing, someone might find themselves becoming numb to the issue or numb to that person's experience and, and unable to empathize with that person. Um, and so those are some of the things that we see with the symptoms of vicarious trauma. And a lot of them mimic or mirror the symptoms of actual trauma. Um, and so there are a lot of, of connections there. I would say one thing I, I add, would add is um, a lot of times we'll hear from folks who maybe are struggling with like frustration that they're not intentionally feeling kind of towards that person or the circumstances, but um, a lot of times we'll see differences, right? And how somebody directly impacted wants to go about navigating options, support, choices, um, versus maybe how somebody supporting them is wanting to navigate, right? So we'll hear that all the time. Well, I wish they would just report or I wish they would, you know, come to the GDSCs, but that may not be what the person wants. And so a lot of times I think that can kind of um, shift into the secondary response too, where folks are really kind of struggling with this doesn't look like maybe how I would want to do that. And how do I kind of best acknowledge my own feelings and concerns in this, um, but also really kind of show up in the way I can most effect effectively support that other person. And so I think there can be really some complicated and nuanced feelings that come um, with that too. So it can be a lot to process. I think, I think the, um, a, a theme that we really hear with this is the struggle with what boundaries look like um, and how, how one can balance both wanting to support someone who is really in need with also um, their own sort of needs for self-care um, and some things like that. I think, I think that is one advantage of, of being on a campus as resourced as this one. Um, and, and what we try to encourage folks that are dealing with this is, is you don't have to be the only one holding this. You can help the person connect um, or at least make them aware of all of the other resources that may be available to them on campus and some other places that they can additionally get support. Um, I think oftentimes, and again, at CAPS we're hearing particularly or overwhelmingly from students, um, we're hearing this sort of um, 
concerned that they feel like they're the only one holding um, holding this for this other person, that they're sort of their only support. And that becomes really overwhelming um, and becomes something that really feeds into that secondary trauma. And so just sort of encouraging this sort of connection um, or the offering of connection with other resources on campus can be a way of sort of uh, lessening or abating some of those, um, those pressures that can contribute to secondary trauma. Absolutely. And if you think about the vast number of folks who have experienced the primary act of harm uh, themselves, and then you think about all the folks that they have maybe told or the one person they have told and how that then continues to impact campus and that ripple effect, we are describing a population of folks who really can use support uh, as they move through their experiences of primary and secondary trauma. Um, and that's a lot of people on campus. So it's just, it's, again, it's a profound issue for us. Uh, we have a question in the chat around resources for faculty and staff who are impacted by secondary trauma, regardless of whether or not it's interpersonal violence uh, or just difficult situations students share. And I'm glad somebody raised this question because of course, secondary trauma can happen for a variety of reasons at a variety of points of disclosure. And one of the things that I'll chime in and say is that the Ombuds Office is a good source of support uh, for all sorts of issues. Um, the EAP program is also a really great option. And so for those of you who are faculty and staff, the Employee Assistance Program has a 24-hour line that you can call if there's been a difficult situation in the office or something's happened and that's come up. It's even a good resource for folks who are like looking for childcare or elder care. The list of things the EAP program can provide is pretty significant. Uh, and I believe they've, they've trained counselors um, at the ready uh, whenever folks call. So that's something you can reach through our HR website. Are there other suggestions that our panelists would offer? Those are the ones that come to my mind immediately. I would say certainly our space gender balance service coordinators were happy um, to provide support. And I think a lot of times too, like if folks are maybe just trying to get kind of some hypothetical processing with folks of, you know, this kind of happened, I don't want to share too many details, um, especially thinking about kind of the broader range of experiences, you know, folks can reach out to the office of the Dean of Students and talk with them about kind of what other resources exist or kind of getting um, kind of just how do they have that kind of initial response. Um, I know folks call the Equal Opportunity and Compliance Office and do a similar um, hypothetical of like, hey, I just received somebody that told me, you know, kind of this broadly, what are your thoughts on this? Um, so there are lots of kind of other offices too outside of that confidentiality that you can navigate um, more in that hypothetical space as well. All right. I think, I, I think it's also a place where um, um, sharing with colleagues or peers and getting um, some help in sort of navigating um, boundaries or navigating sort of how you're processing things, or if there's a mentor that you have at work, that can also be a place of sort of helping to try and figure out that balance within, within your own sort of space. Thanks. And so a few other questions for our panel. Um, and please do keep the Q&A coming from the audience. We're happy to take those as they come in. I wanted to get... It's okay, Holly. Oh, shall I go? Okay. <laughs> um, I was just gonna say, you know, we've covered a lot of ground in this conversation, but an an hour and some change is is not enough for folks to um, be experts on this issue. And so, what I would encourage is for people to continue to engage with with these these topics. So, learning more about what violence looks like on campus, what's being done to prevent it, how you can be involved, how you can be a supportive entity to people in your lives who have experienced trauma, um, what's being done in terms of mental health resources on campus. Um, and so I think that there is a lot of continued learning going out from this space. And I, I don't want folks to, to leave this conversation here. I want you to, to leave this with just enough information to make you want to know more. Um, and so I'm hoping that that's what, what people are taking away from this. Thank you. And I would just add, like, we know, um, you know, I appreciate folks taking time out of their day to be part of this conversation. And we know you all are the bridges to our resources. Um, so like I said earlier, a lot of folks don't even know we exist. And so they're going to find you first. Um, and we know that folks are more likely to reach out to their friends, their trusted staff, their supervisors, their colleagues. And so I think even, you know, you don't need to be the expert in all of this to be able to make a huge fundamental difference for folks. Um, and so really thinking through like what what can you do to validate that the impact does exist and that it can look the way it does for folks um, and really trying to help connect them to that different support that they might want. 
Um, so just appreciate you all taking the time to learn and be part of our campus community because we have to create this kind of fabric network together. And, Thank you. and just to piggyback off what Holly said, if, um, if you've not yet gone to the safe.unc.edu website, um, that is a wonderful place to familiarize yourself with a lot of, with all of the resources that are available on this campus um, to, so that you have those things um, in your back pocket it um, whenever needed. And so as you're um, continuing to sort of learn more, um, that's, that's just a wonderful um, place to place to start. Thank you. And because like, I can't resist closing out with a couple of other slides that we had. One which emphasizes the point y'all were, I think Holly just made around when folks seek support, they often go to a friend first, right? So it's so important to be that safe point of disclosure. Uh, and I think that's just really stark. Uh, the GVSCs, so this is something from Holly and Kayla's work, have given us a few quick tips about how to be a good supporter. And while I continue to encourage you to take the Haven training, this is sort of a short top five of things you can do uh, if somebody discloses that they've experienced something difficult, gender-based violence or something else. Listen more than you respond, validate their experience, recognize that coping and response can be different from day to day, uh, create a plan to follow up with that person, and connect with resources both for them and for you. You're not an investigator, you're a supporter. So listening is really helpful. And then just to scroll through back to the thing that Avery brought up again, which of course I think you have in the chat as well, which is a safe.unc.edu website, which is just so important. If we're gonna be looking at um, any kind of resources, prevention materials, otherwise you'll see uh, what you need probably on the safe website and certainly contact information for us all. So with that, unless there are any other questions that y'all wanna post in the chat, I think we are about ready to close. Is there anything else for the good of the order? All right. Thank you all so much for spending time with us today. I hope this was useful and we look forward to continuing the dialogue. Thanks so much.